Less oil than we thought, more high-end chips than we expected, and trying to get our hopes for the future just right, given where we're headed. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, Larry Culp of GE on his remarkable five years of turnaround for an American icon and what comes next. You're far better off being strong rather than just big. Neil Ferguson of the Hoover Institution on the promise and the perils of artificial intelligence and what we can learn from the Cold War. There were problems posed when nuclear fission uh, was developed. It had both a destructive use, uh, atomic bombs, and a potentially very productive use uh, as a source of energy. And Pete Stavros of KKR, together with Kathy Balhos of Charter Next Generation, on giving employees a true seat at the corporate table. We lay the foundation of a different type of culture, which is ownership. We normalize the fact that management and labor don't get along. I want to flip the script on that. Global Wall Street eased its way into fall this week with continued disappointing economic news out of China, but a discovery that Huawei may have found a way to make high-end microchips despite the U.S. restrictions. It shows that China can do mostly with domestic manufacturing a lot of the advanced uh, chip making and development for a smartphone. Something President Xi won't have to answer questions about at the G20 meetings in India this weekend because he decided not to go. It just takes away uh, from the Xi Jinping's uh, absence, takes away uh, the primacy in a way. Saudi Arabia and then Russia announced extended restrictions on their oil production, catching markets by surprise and raising the specter of a return to higher oil prices. The fact that oil has reached um, $90 per barrel is significant, and it means that um, the whole commodity index pushes higher. In the United States, everyone was looking for any scrap of information to confirm the soft landing last week's jobs numbers suggested, with the ISM services number coming in hot, which made everyone fear more rate hikes. While the Fed's beige book pointed to subdued jobs growth and modest economic activity. I think the Fed would be very unwise to raise rates again just because of a short-term spike in enthusiasm in the service sector. And the U.S. Open headed toward its finals, driven by new faces, the return of some real American contenders, and a media showdown in the way of some people getting to watch. You know, we just came out of this golden age of 15 years of Roger, Rafa, Novak, and the baton has not only been passed, I think it's been thrown to Carlos Alcaraz. <laughs> And the equity markets this week certainly spent a lot of their time trying to get their expectations in line with reality as the S&P 500 lost 1.3 percent, in part because of rising oil prices, to close at 44.57. But that's still well above the median year-end call of our Bloomberg elves of 4,300. The Nasdaq did even worse, giving up 1.93 percent. But the one clear winner was the dollar, with the Bloomberg dollar index showing it up for the eighth week in a row. That is the longest winning streak since January of 2005. For her take on what we are seeing in the markets, we welcome back now Christina Hooper. She is Invesco Global Market Strategist. Christina, always great to have you with us. So what did you make of this week? It, it doesn't seem to be in one straight line at the moment. Well, David, I think this was really a story of bad news is good news, good news is bad news. And this week it was good economic data that raised fears that the Fed may have to continue hiking rates. And that's really all it was to it. But actually, if we go through the data, um, not everything was that positive, right? Yes, everyone seized on the ISM services, but actually the S&P services PMI wasn't as good. Um, if we look at initial jobless claims, yes, um, they're lower. Um, get, you know, the lowest we've seen in, in a while, and it's been on a trend for a few weeks. But other readings suggest more tepid um, labor market, right? What we saw from the JOLT survey last week. So I think markets have been concerned because of a few data points. But I've always stressed that not every data point is going to perfectly support the narrative of a disinflationary trend, but we are very much in that disinflationary trend. We've had a big debate about uh, smooth landing, uh, bumpy landing, hard landing. Where are you? 
So I'm firmly in the camp of a bumpy landing. I think it is almost Pollyanna-ish to assume there's going to be a soft landing, which in my opinion suggests that there's no damage. There will be significant damage, in my opinion, in certain areas of the economy. That doesn't mean we're going to go into a recession. I don't think we will. Uh, but certainly credit conditions have tightened significantly. There will be pressure. And in fact, we know um, that typically we see lagged effects of monetary policy. It hasn't caught up yet. But I do think we will see more damage. The good news, though, is that we are also seeing very significant disinflation. So I'm in agreement that we don't need to hike rates again. Disinflation. Are we on a route to 2 percent? And if so, how long is it going to take us to get there? I do believe that. And I'm happy you asked that because the Chicago Fed economist just put out a paper arguing that we are actually on that path and that we will get to 2 percent inflation. Now, it will take some time to get there, but that's OK, because, again, typically we see you know, a significant period of time between when uh, monetary policy is enacted and when it shows up in the economy. What does this say to investors? What do you do in this sort of world of, as you say, bumpy landing? There's going to be some uncertainty, even if it's not going to go off a cliff. What does an investor do? Well, investors have to understand that there are going to be shifts in leadership because markets are uncertain right now. Uh, last week, this week was a perfect example of that. Um, we have a lot of fear right now. But once we get clarity uh, that the Fed really has ended its rate hike cycle, that's when markets can look ahead and start to discount an economic recovery. So that would mean being positioned in more in cyclicals, more in smaller caps, but also looking outside the U.S. International is going to uh, be a lot more attractive as the U.S. dollar weakens. And while it has been strong, I do believe that we will see it start to weaken once we have that clarity that the Fed has stopped hiking rates. Briefly, you're worried about oil. Oil prices did go up this week. Certainly that's a concern, um, but it takes time to filter into the rest of the economy to make it into core. Um, so if this is a relatively short burst, uh, I'm not that concerned about it. Is the Fed going to be concerned? I don't think so, because the Fed's looking at a mosaic of data. Yep. And again, this is about a, a very strong disinflationary trend that I think they can see. And that was supported by what we heard anecdotally in the Federal Reserve Beige Book this week. Christina, it's always such a treat to have you here. Thank you so much. That's Christina Hooper of Invesco. Next week, we'll continue to look for evidence of a soft landing in CPI numbers on Wednesday. But it's helpful to remember we've been here before, or at least in a version of here, as Ed Yardeni told Louis Rukeyser on Wall Street Week back in 2000. I'd say that um, most of the risks are that the soft landing we're having now turns into a hard landing. Maybe oil prices go higher, maybe we have a really bad winter. Uh, in which uh, scenario the Fed might actually be encouraged to lower interest rates a bit, just to provide some liquidity to take the pressure off. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Generative artificial intelligence poses all sorts of opportunities and risks for investors the world over. And one of the founders of DeepMind, that's the AI startup now part of Google, has written a book, The Coming Wave, Technology, Power, and the 21st Century's Greatest Dilemma, in which he sets out the wonderful opportunities as well as the terrifying threats posed by AI and the need for nation states to develop structures to contain this powerful new technology. At this moment, we have to be optimistic and encouraging of the nation state. This is a moment when the state has to adapt and evolve, just as we all have to evolve to these new technologies. There's no way to put the genie back in the bottle. This really is happening. So the art is going to be around shaping it in the public interest and making sure that our democratic governments remain in control. The historian Neil Ferguson has written not just about economics and money, but also about the politics of disaster in his book, Doom. He is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution as well as a Bloomberg opinion contributor. And we welcome now back to Wall Street Week. So Neil, thanks so much for being with us. I know you've read the book because you call it dazzling in a, col a column actually you wrote for Bloomberg here. Uh, give us your biggest takeaway from this book. Why do you say it's something that no one can afford not to read. Well, Mustafa Suleiman knows what he's talking about. He was really present at the creation of the big AI breakthroughs of recent years. One of the founders of DeepMind, which has been a key pioneer in the field. Uh, and so he comes uh, to the subject with a really uh, almost unrivaled expertise. Uh, he was there in the room when they built uh, AIs that could beat world champions at chess and, and then at Go. 
so I, I respect uh, him as a true authority in the subject. Not everybody who writes about AI is nearly as well versed as as Mustafa is. The other interesting thing about him is he didn't start out as a, a, a tech guy at all. He dropped out of Oxford and went into politics, had a really interesting early career working in the voluntary uh, sector. And so when he says we have a problem, and it's a problem that today's nation states aren't really well set up to deal with, I think we should all listen. Uh, because I don't find it plausible that just letting it rip as some people uh, would advocate, is prudent given the potentially very dangerous things that AI is capable of doing. Yeah, as you say, Neil, he really sets out wonderful things and dangerous things at the same time. Uh, you are an historian, of course, and one of the things that Mr. Suleiman talks about is the need for what he calls containment. And he admits that that sort of sounds like George Kennan's proposal for dealing with the Soviet Union. As you look back in history, are there analogies? They're always rough, they're always imperfect, but have there been times when we could get our arms around some potentially dangerous new technology and really control it? Well, you see, the interesting thing uh, it, about the book is that it has lots of interesting historical analogies. I mean, the wilder enthusiast for AI will tell you that it's some combination of the fire, the wheel, electrification, uh, and nuclear weapons. Uh, what Mustafa zeroes in on is uh, the analogy with the Cold War. And I was tempted to suggest he might turn out to be the Robert Oppenheimer of AI, because he observes that there were uh, problems posed when nuclear fission uh, was developed. It had both a destructive use, uh, atomic bombs, and a potentially very productive use uh, as a source of energy. And uh, he shows how some of the challenges of regulating this new technology suggest ways in which we might uh, proceed today. Uh, for example, uh, he suggests that there should be arms control talks on AI between the United States and China, which are the only two superpowers really developing AI on a massive scale. Certainly, Neil, we get a sense from the book that it is a difficult thing to achieve at all. But I wonder if it isn't made more difficult by another thing that Mr. Suleiman talks about in his book, which is what, in fact, AI could do itself to the nature of the nation state because it really feeds back potentially on itself in destructive ways. At a time when a lot of nation states aren't that strong, let's be honest, right now at all, they aren't that cohesive right now, we have a possible risk of AI for the very Treaty of Westphalia, I guess, as I would put it. This is a really well-argued, very knowledgeable account of the costs and benefits of the strengths and the dangers of the AI revolution. And that's why it's, for me, the must-read book on this topic. And, uh, and I'm, I'm really glad I got a chance to, to review it, because I, I think it needs to be read not just uh, by interested uh, viewers, but policymakers need to read this book, because they have got to move fast before there are AI-designed bioweapons uh, that have the capacity to make the COVID-19 pandemic uh, look like a rounding error in mortality statistics. Neil, finally, given how fiendishly complex this is, as you say, how fast it is coming, and the potential wide-ranging, almost ubiquitous effects, for good and not for good, if you were going to paint a scenario where actually this comes out okay, what is the path forward? Well, I mean, the Cold War analogy uh, is helpful here because we didn't have World War III, and in the end, the United States and Soviet Union didn't use their vast nuclear arsenals against one another. And the hope has to be that there's some elements of mutually assured destruction that will prevent the US and China unleashing AI through weapon systems uh, against one another. Uh, I think the difficulty with this genie is that it's, it's out of the bottle and now in so many hands. The, the thing about the Cold War was that there really weren't that many nuclear powers, nuclear non-proliferation really worked. The thing that worries me about AI is that it is spreading rapidly, not only among states, but amongst non-state actors, including criminals. And one of my you know, profound beliefs is that with any technological innovation, the first people who show up are the geeks themselves. And, and the people who show up next are, are, the, are the criminals and bad actors. And somewhere bringing up the rear are the people in governments who are supposed to regulate this kind of thing. I'm afraid we're entering the danger zone where bad actors are going to take advantage of things like deep fakes. Uh, and it's going to take the states 
are much too long to catch up. I'll give you just one example before we run out of time. Think what AI can do to the 2024 election. I mean, if you thought social media made 2016 kind of crazy, I think you ain't seen nothing yet. Okay, thank you so much, Neil. Really appreciate your insights here. That's Neil Ferguson of the Hoover Institution. Coming up, private equity doing well by doing good. We talk with KKR Global co-head of private equity, Pete Stavros, and Kathy Ballhost, CEO of a company he has invested in to explore the world of employee ownership. That's coming up next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. At the beginning of the summer, we brought you a story putting together two things we don't usually associate with one another, private equity buyouts on the one hand and employee stock ownership on the other. But KKR has been putting them together for some time now and has found some real success. So we welcome back the man behind the effort. He is Peter Stavros, KKR Global Co-Head of Private Equity and someone who's been working with Pete to put it into practice. Kathy Bolhos, she is CEO of Charter Next Generation. So welcome both of you. Pete, welcome back. Great to meet you. This is wonderful to have you, Kathy. Thank you. Great to be here. Let's start with you, Pete. Uh, so we've talked about what you've been doing at KKR, sort of the principles of how it works. Uh, how specifically has it applied in this specific instance? So what we do each time, what we've done in the case of Charter Next Gen, is we lay the foundation of a different type of culture, which is ownership. So we made every employee at Charter Next Gen a stockholder in the company. It's important to note it was a free and incremental benefit. So we're not asking workers to invest out of pocket. We're not asking people to trade off wages for stock. So it doesn't come out of their paycheck. It does not come out of their paycheck. It's a free incremental benefit. It's also important to note it's a meaningful amount of stock. So we are hoping at Charter Next Gen, now this is equity, it's risk, it's not a guarantee, but if we hit our plan, that we can show people a path to earning 100% of their income in stock. Now that, that's just the foundation. Really the purpose of it is to change the culture, to get people more engaged on the job, to get people to think like business owners, and over time, get the quit rate down and the engagement scores up. And in the short time we've been working together with Charter Next Gen, the quit rates are down 33%, the number of engaged employees up 23%, safety's improved. So even in the two years we've been at this, we're starting to make real progress. So Kathy, take it from your side of it. Yes. Uh, uh, Charter Next Gen, as I understand it, is a, a leading producer of film used in packaging. A lot yes. of things that we buy when we go to the supermarket has some of your film around it. Uh, you were a successful company before Pete came along. It's not like you were struggling about to go belly up. What did you see in this opportunity that otherwise you might not have seen from somebody else? Well, first of all, this, this is a dream for me to be able to offer equity ownership to every employee. I look at it, every single employee is part of the success of the company. It's a team sport. So it doesn't make sense that you would only reward the top executives, the top 5% with equity. So the opportunity to give equity to everyone aligns the incentives. So now everyone has the same incentive, which is to create value for the long term. You know, when you give an employee who's living on an hourly wage the opportunity to build that nest egg, that's life changing. And that's our goal here is, is to really have an amazing outcome and give them that nest egg. Pensions have largely uh, gone away, so there's no opportunity to get ahead. I think about the cash compensation, that's what you use to pay your bills. The equity is what you use to create wealth. And if you don't have an opportunity for equity, how are you going to create wealth? You mentioned you have some encouraging returns so far. How far can you get to go? I mean, I, you must believe in it because I think you've got a documentary in the process, right, that you're working on with Kathy. We've released two clips so far of the uh, documentary film and no pressure, but th this has to be a big win. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm fully committed. I, I am going to do my best and I know our people will too. This has created such an esprit de corps in the company and, you know, the what I think is really important as a leader is to take the people metrics as seriously as you take the business metrics. So much of the time, we focus on profit, focus on sales, focus on things we can measure. But you know, for us, it's really about focusing on engagement. Think about the fact that in the US, 40%, 40 to 50% of manufacturing companies face a turnover issue. That's how many people quit. 40 to 50% of employees quit their jobs every year. Think about if you can reduce that down to 5%, the value that you can unlock. 
So that's where we're focused now. We also want to give our employees a voice. So we've implemented things like employee-directed capital. We give each plant a budget. You decide how this capital is going to be spent. You have to vote on it. You have to agree. But then imagine spending this money to improve your break room, making an outdoor eating area. When you give the worker the decision around their work, that helps to create engagement. We also let them decide what charitable organizations we want to sponsor in their community. Again, they vote on it and they decide what impact they want to have in the community with our charitable contributions. Pete, one of the things that's happened since you and I last spoke actually is a fair amount of uh, organized labor activity. As we have a strike right now with the Writers Guild and SAG after, who knows what's going to happen with UAW? It doesn't look real good right now. But as I listen to what Kathy's saying right now, that's a world away from talking about hundreds of work rules to say exactly who goes where, uh, what. Do these two things fit together? Does employee ownership fit with organized labor? I think it can. I think historically, Organized labor took a skeptical eye, understandably, to ownership. You know, because to a union, the employees are their members, not your not your employees, mm -hmm. right? So, when you start then aligning their members with your company, that can be a conflict. I think that's changing. I think there's a real openness to to new models uh, and aligning capital uh, in labor. And as you note, we've gone from a, a period of time where, yeah, you saw some strife in autos and manufacturing, but now you're seeing it everywhere. Um, and people, they want to be a part of something. They want shared gains. Um, they, want to, they want transparency around how we're going to manage through all of this change driven by technology. AI, you know, in the case of, of the, the writer strike, transitions to EVs in the case of UAW. There's a lot of complicated questions we're going to have to answer. And I think we're going to all do a lot better if we're in the boat together. So, Mary, finally to you, yeah. uh, we don't know how this will end up. I guess we'll have to mm -hmm. wait for the documentary to find out how it ends yes. up. But, and I know you can't predict what's happening, but how big a difference could this make in some of your employees' lives? You mentioned before mm -hmm. you get a paycheck to pay yeah. the bills, but, yeah. but it's very hard to amass capital, mm -hmm. to amass wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, how good could this be for some of your employees, do you think, or hope? Life-changing. I mean, when you're living paycheck to paycheck, you know, 40 percent of Americans have less than $400. They're one car repair bill, one medical emergency, away from financial devastation. Think about building a nest egg of $50,000, $100,000. There are employees who have said, this will end generational poverty in my family. And I mean, that's inspiring to me. That, you know, yes, I have been a private equity sponsored CEO for 13 years now, I've sold the company before. This one to me is the most special. This is the one that I know I'm going to work the hardest on, and I know my team is going to work the hardest on. And it's really about breaking down that wall between the plant and the office. When you talk about union, that's it. We normalize that. We normalize the fact that management and labor don't get along. I want to flip the script on that. And we're going to have to fix this. In, so in manufacturing, we've now got 600,000 open jobs. National Association of Manufacturers says we're going to be short 2 million workers by 2030. When you talk to manufacturing CEOs and you say, what's your biggest concern? It's not supply chain. It's not state of the economy. And my number one concern CEOs in manufacturing says I can't attract and retain people. So it's, going, it's great at the company level. We're going to have to do this or something like this at the, at the uh, kind of economy level if we're going to continue to be successful. Many thanks to Kathy Bolhaus of Charter Next Generation and Pete Stavros of KKR. Coming up, there was a day when the very survival of General Electric was in question, but that day was five years ago. And today, things look very different. We sit down with the man who oversaw the remaking of an American corporate icon, Larry Culp, CEO of GE. We couldn't be in a better position with respect to the post-pandemic recovery in aerospace. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. General Electric. It was founded in 1892 when Thomas Edison put together his electric companies under the banner of GE with the help of John Pierpont Morgan.
It grew to be one of the largest and most profitable companies in the world, with a market capitalization approaching $600 billion in 2000. Its operations have spanned plastics, appliances, computers, and TV networks. And along the way, it developed under Jack Welch a legendary reputation for management and grooming leadership from within. What you do with personnel around bad behavior does more to establish a culture and good behavior. Role model those behaviors with great rewards for those that have the right culture and public hangings for those that don't. I was very fortunate to uh, grow and be mentored by Jack Welch. And, you know, Jack was laser focused on metrics, appropriate metrics. But then the great financial crisis hit, and the conglomerate Mr. Welch built was hit particularly hard, causing profits and revenues to plummet as problems mounted, causing the market cap to plummet to under $70 billion by 2018. We had good businesses, good people, good initiatives, but at the end of the day, the stock price lagged. Uh, there are some things that uh, didn't work. Uh, we didn't get as much value out of GE Capital as we could have. Uh, we had tough in-use markets at the end of my tenure. I gave the board a lot of things to work on. So it's a complicated story, but I, I think the way it's been told has been incomplete. Then GE turned to a new CEO, one who had led not at GE, but at Danaher. Larry Culp took over as CEO in October of 2018 and undertook a fundamental rethinking of the company, selling assets, paying down debt, and ultimately leading the move to break the company up into three independent companies focused on healthcare, power, and aerospace. All they'll have left of meaningful size is power, which is a problem, and aerospace, which is a terrific business. Uh, if they get a health, rid of health care, everything else is really small. Now the parts of GE add up to more than the whole did before with combined market capitalization of about $150 billion, giving business schools, once again, a case study in management and leadership, but this time more in focus and execution, and not so much in amassing size. And to take us through that saga of GE, we turn to the man himself. He's Larry Culp. He's the chairman and CEO of General Electric. So welcome, Larry. Great to have you here on Wall Street Week. Uh, take us back uh, five years, because it's almost exactly five years now since you took over. You had some idea about what you're getting into. You've been on the board. Why did you take the job? <laughs> David, always good to be with you. And it's hard to believe that it's been five years here come the 1st of October. I think it was really, in many respects, simple. GE, an incredibly important company to our country and to the world. GE, a company that I had long admired through the course of my career, and given what I had heard, given what I had learned as a director, clearly a, a, a challenge, perhaps the challenge of my generation. And it was really those three reasons that ultimately led me to say, yes, I'll put my uniform back on, and here we are. So you put your uniform back on. Uh, what did you set out to do first? What were your priorities as you sat down the first day in that desk? Because so often, even if you're close to the job, until you've had the job, you haven't had it. Uh, that's right. I don't remember sitting down much that first day. Right? There was a lot, uh, a lot happening. But I, I knew relatively quickly that we had to do two things. One, we had to get our arms around the balance sheet issues. We had over $140 billion of debt outstanding. That was a crushing load in a host of different ways. And we needed to get to a better place in terms of the day-to-day -day operation of the business. And those turned out to be priorities that really took us through the first couple of years, deleveraging and running the businesses better. It was really that simple. As I say, you were on the board for a short time mm -hmm. before you took over. Uh, so some of the problems you knew about. But you couldn't anticipate Boeing 737 MAX, you couldn't anticipate the pandemic, couldn't anticipate supply chain, war in Ukraine. Did that change your plan? Well, I think early on, we knew that we needed the utmost sense of urgency around the deleveraging. When a number of us had joined the board through the course of 2018, the plan of record was to actually spin our healthcare business, much as we did earlier this year. But I think we found, as we dug into it, that while that was a good idea, we couldn't possibly pull it off, given the leverage level and given the performance of the other businesses, which is why we made the quick pivot through the fall into early 2019 to actually sell a small part of healthcare, our biopharma business, for $20 billion. And that was really the first big step 
we took toward the deleveraging. All the while, I was spending time with the team touring facilities, talking to customers, trying to get my arms around in terms of what we were doing day in and day out and why we weren't anywhere close to our full potential operationally. You've mentioned a couple of times improving the operations, which sounds easy, but in my experience, it's really hard. Uh, so how could you, as a, something of an outsider, come in and understand where you needed to improve operations? And that, of course, is not just what people do, but who's doing it. Well, exactly right. And for me, David, my approach has always been it's about the team first and foremost. Fortunately, we inherited, I think, a, a tremendous team at GE in each of the three businesses at corporate up and down the, the org chart. So what we did is we set about making sure we, we knew where we were organizationally. We dove in deeply to make sure we understood how we were running the businesses, not just in the C-suite, but all the way down to the factory floor. And there were a host of opportunities that we as a team identified, areas where we could do better, we could do better for our customers, reduce cycle times, improve our delivery performance, all the while taking a, late, a lot of waste out of the system, waste that often, frankly, helped us improve our profitability and our cash flows. It was a daily battle. It was a game of inches. But over the course of time, we really were able to lay in our lean operating model so that today we're able to perform at much higher levels across General Electric in ways that I think are going to serve all three of our businesses very well going forward. How did you bring your board along with you? Because again, GE is just such an iconic company in the United States, to break that up into three pieces uh, is quite a move. Did you expect to do that from the beginning? When you took the job, did you think you'd break it up? Well, again, a number of us that joined in 2018 knew about the health care idea, that we would spin health care and create a, an independent company. And that, that made sense then. It made sense earlier this year than when we did it. But we really didn't have the strategic degrees of freedom. We didn't have the balance sheet to do it. So early on there, when I became CEO, of course, that was something that had never happened in the company's history. We didn't necessarily do, make that move from a position of strength. The board, fortunately, was focused on what we were focused on as a management team, the deleveraging and improving our, our daily operations. But that board, then and now, I think is one of the best, if not the best, boards in the country. This is a group of people who really ran toward the fire. As we reset the board, there were a lot of folks, David, you'll recall, did, didn't know if GE was going to make it, yeah. right? GE of all companies. And these were a number of people who joined the board for many of the same reasons that I did. They pitched in. It wasn't about themselves. It wasn't about their reputations. They just wanted to make sure that we did the right thing for the business. But as time passed, we put over $100 billion of debt aside. We improved our operations so that we were serving customers better. We were generating a respectable amount of free cash flow. When the pandemic lifted, or began to lift in the spring of 21, we could see that we had more degrees of strategic freedom. And it was really that summer when we began to debate what's the best path forward for these three outstanding businesses. And that's what led in November of 21 to, to the announcement that we made. Uh, Larry, how did you manage ego? And I mean ego of the company, of the people who work there, of the board, and even your own ego. Because there are a lot of CEOs, a lot of leaders say, I want to have the biggest company. And GE had been the biggest company. Yeah. Uh, and this is a decision, we're not going to be the biggest company. We're never going to be the biggest company again. How did you manage the egos involved? Well, I think I've long believed that you're far better off being strong rather than just big. And that was a little bit of the, the evolution of our conversation. We're not going to be an all-singing, all-dancing GE going forward. But that doesn't mean we can't lead the energy transition. That doesn't mean we can't be a leader in precision healthcare. That doesn't mean we can't define the future of flight. And that's what these three businesses can do. Now, they'll do them on their own. We'll share our history. We'll share our brand. We'll hopefully share some of the operating characteristics that we've been talking about. But on a go-forward basis, I don't think there was a lot of ego involved. I think the board knew that our duty was to set the businesses up for success, to serve the teams, to serve the customers in that way. I think for some, when we were going through the deliberations, it was tough to think about a different construct than the one they had joined. But as we looked forward, and throughout that process, David, everyone was looking forward, I think there was easy consensus 
that each of these three businesses on their own bottoms were going to be industry leaders. The alignment from the boardroom through management to investors was going to be additive to the cause. So when we went around the table, it was an easy vote. Geez, Larry Culp will be staying with us as we turn to those three businesses and where they are going next. That's going to be next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston, and we are back now with Larry Culp, the head of GE. So, Larry, we've talked about how you got to where you are now. Let's talk about where you're going next. And I mean, GE as a company, the three independent businesses, you've already spun off healthcare, you're about to spin off power as well. And give us a sense of where you're going. Let's start with aerospace, which is the one that you look like you're going to be sticking with at least for a while. Aerospace is, seems to be hitting on all cylinders, if you use cylinders anymore in aircraft engines. <laughs> but, but you're doing well. How big can that get? Well, David, we couldn't be in a, a better position with respect to the post-pandemic recovery in aerospace. You, you, you've seen the, the performance thus far this year. We're really on a record pace. Given both the return to flight really around the world now as people see places they haven't been to, and at the same time, they're looking to modernize and expand their fleets. So we have tremendous backlogs with our major airframers, Boeing, Airbus, uh, for example. Supply chain challenges are significant, and right alongside everything we're doing on the commercial side, we've seen a really strong uptick in our defense business, as one would imagine, both with fixed wing and, and rotary. So in terms of how big this business can be, we're, I think, on a path where we could be growing in the mid-single digit, high single digit range for some time. That would put us well north of $40 billion in but a few years. Lot of opportunity. We have, I think, an enviable position in propulsion. But again, it's not about how big we get. It's about how strong we are. And are we serving our customers? Are we taking care of our team? Are we doing well by, where, by way of our shareholders? We're optimistic that we will. What's on the table at the point? You, you've spent your five years really redoing the balance sheet, really fixing mm -hmm. the cash flow situation, retiring a lot of debt. Uh, capital allocation maybe hasn't been so much of an issue because you're just trying to retire that debt. Going forward, you may well have some capital to work with. So what are the possibilities, both in terms of acquisition but also of sale, potentially? Well, I think that we want to be wise stewards of that capital, right? I, I've long believed that investors give you a license to reinvest in your business, and you need to be careful with that license lest it gets pulled. But I think what we've tried to do is set up all three of the businesses to be in a position where they're, they are well capitalized, investment grade, and will have the opportunities to think through not only their organic options, be it M&A, small, mid-size, probably not something large and uh, headline breaking, but at the same time, how do we think about buybacks? How do we think about dividends? So I think you'll see each of the three companies, once we spin GE Vernova sometime early next year, be in a position where they'll have tailored, balanced capital allocation policies that will be in effect. I'm confident all three boards will, will carry forward that responsibility well. You mentioned Vernova. Let's turn to power. Sure. Uh, renewables have been a challenge for just about everybody at this point. Uh, including for GE, although you think you're going to get toward profitability here before the spinoff, as I understand it. Yes. Uh, what are the challenges? What is the potential for profitability out of that renewables business? Well, we've made a lot of progress, David, in our GE power businesses the last several years. That's really been, I think, ground zero with respect to the improvements that we have made in, in Vernova and GE at large. And we're really running the power playbook in our renewables businesses, principally in onshore wind, which is, I think, the battleground today. We think that can be a high single-digit operating margin business in time. Everything that we've talked about over the last four quarters in terms of the nature of that turnaround has really played out, both in terms of our field performance, our cost reduction efforts, and just the day-to-day the, the, the -day rhythms in the business. I was with them just a couple of weeks ago, and I'm really encouraged by what we're seeing. The Inflation Reduction Act has driven a lot of demand, not only in our onshore and our offshore wind businesses, but also in our grid automation businesses, which is a part of GE Vernova that a lot of people don't talk about. So I think we really feel that the combination of all the self-help 
that we have laid in. In combination with the Inflation Reduction Act here in the States, everything that's happening relative to the energy transition in Europe sets this business up to really be a, a strong performer for investors and clearly the leader in the energy transition going forward. Let's talk about the third leg to the stool, uh, GE Healthcare, uh, which is, I understand, you're still chair of that board. Non-executive. Non-executive, uh, fair enough. Well, well, you said that you find the healthcare business an attractive business. Where do you see the future for GE Healthcare? Well, again, if you just look at where we are from an, a core imaging perspective, we really sit at the heart of all things Precision Health. And as we think about not only what we do from a hardware perspective, but software now with AI, there's a lot more I think we're going to be able to do to help caregivers deliver better outcomes for, for patients. It's interesting, Larry, in listening to you as you talk about possible M&A, and you're not saying you're going to do anything. You talk about small, maybe mid-size. You said you'd be sort of surprised, whether it's aerospace, whether it's healthcare, device, to do a really big, I think you said, attention headline-grabbing yeah. thing. Why is that? Why do you kind of think that that's really relatively less likely? Well, I, th I think that we need to demonstrate to investors, we need to demonstrate to our board, and even ourselves, that we can be outstanding in identifying opportunities, going through due diligence, negotiations, valuation, let alone integration. So I'd rather see us get some reps and make sure we're building that muscle. That hasn't been a focus for us the last five years, but build that muscle across all three GE businesses you can do that with small businesses, you can do that with mid-sized businesses. And then over time, if and only if, because again, it's about being strong, not big, if something more significant came along that made sense for us, we'd obviously consider it. But I don't want us to go out big game hunting day one. I, I think that's a, a path to ruin, first things first. Uh, uh, Larry, it's been just about five years now. It's been quite a five years for General Electric and for you. If you accomplished at this point what you set out to do at the beginning, which isn't to say there isn't more you could do, but if you look back on Larry Culp five years ago, have you basically checked the boxes that you wanted to get checked? Well, I, I think five years ago we knew that we had to do two things. We had to work down that debt load and to have over $100 billion of debt behind us now, I think we can check that box. We wanted to improve operations. We've come a long way. But there's still so much to do, David, so I'm hesitant to check that box. We're in a much better place, but in the spirit of what my Japanese senseis describe as kaiza, continuous improvement, I don't want to check that box, because the moment we do, then we're done. And uh, we're far from, from done at this point. Uh, Larry, you've had at least two major successful careers, first at Danaher and now at GE. Uh, is there more for Larry Culp? What do you do next, or are you happy doing what you're doing? I'm thrilled, David, to be where I am today. We need to make sure that we work the plan that we have in place for Vernova, right? So that, that box is not yet checked, but I think Scott Strasick will be the CEO of that business and the team are on a, uh, on a glide path to, to go next year. And then I'll be wholly focused, other than my non-executive duties at healthcare, on making sure that GE Aerospace is poised to lead the future of flight. Frankly, David, it's been a very long time since I've been able to focus on a single business. Mm. You'd have to go back to the 90s when I was a younger man at, at Danaher. So I'm excited about the opportunity of getting closer to customers, closer to our technologies, spend more time with the team. But we're, we're some months away before help Vernova goes. So first things first, but uh, I'm, I'm more than happy. Larry, thank you so much for being on Wall Street. It was really a pleasure to have you here. That's Larry Culp of General Electric. Coming up, stormy weather. But do we really understand what nature is trying to tell us? That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. Look deep into nature and then you will understand everything better. So wrote Albert Einstein after the death of his sister in 1951. And these days there's plenty of nature demanding that we look into it deeply. Though it's not as clear that we're understanding any better. It has been a summer of extreme weather. Record heat hit Europe hard, bringing Greek wildfires with it. While halfway around the world, an entire town burned down to the ground in Hawaii, leaving hundreds dead or missing.
a once in a lifetime hurricane came ashore, not in Florida, but in Southern California. And a series of typhoons pummeled Hong Kong, Taiwan, and mainland China. Scientists warn that you cannot trace any single weather event to climate change. But the degree and the frequency of extreme weather overall is because of our warming globe, creating what some call growing natural disaster risk. What we're seeing now is just repeated examples of natural disasters, climate extremes happening at scales we haven't seen before, in places we haven't seen them occur before. And investors like Chris Ailman of Calster say we should get ready for more. You're going to see more flight disruptions, more dirty air, more weather extremes, heat and cold, more droughts and rain. And that's absolutely going to be consistent for the rest of our lifetimes. Get used to it and adjust. And that means our investment models have to adjust to the volatility. It's not just investment models adjusting because of what we've done to nature. Many companies are racing one another to come up with ambitious goals for what's called zero emissions over some pretty tight time horizons. And that's where the understanding everything part of Einstein's admonition comes into play. Because it turns out that it's not so easy to reverse course and slow everything down, much less reverse it. Take, for example, Fortescue Metals. It's the third largest mining company in the world based in Australia. And less than a year ago, it announced a zero emissions goal for its iron ore operations by 2030. But since then, it has reported lower earnings, brought in a new CEO who lasted only six months, followed by its CFO out the door only days later. Christine Morris, we barely knew ye. After three months in the job, now the CFO has gone, and she replaced the long-serving CFO, Ian Wells, and he left in January. Or fossil fuel giant Shell. Two years ago, it got all of our attention by announcing it would invest $100 million a year in carbon offsets. But since then, it's invested less than half of that in projects that generated very few real offsets. So Shell's new CEO last week quietly retired the program. Burning Man has never really billed itself as an environmental movement. It's an annual event in the middle of the desert in northwest Nevada celebrating art and self-expression and self-reliance. But this year, whatever its purpose, nature crashed the Burning Man party in a big way, putting to a test all that talk about self-reliance. It all started off with protests using a 28-foot trailer across the road to block traffic because of its carbon emissions, which, by the way, turned out to be the equivalent of burning 27,000 metric tons of coal, according to the Burning Man project itself. And as if to underscore the issue, nature sent torrential rains, the equivalent of two months' worth in a single day, which turned the desert into a toxic mud pit, forcing people like Chris Rock to trek five miles through that mud to reach a highway and bum a ride from some of his friends. While others stayed until the bitter end for the ritual burning of the giant man once the weather had cleared enough, and at least some still considered it worth it. I honestly think that this is the best burn ever. Seriously, like this has given us the opportunity to rise to radical self-reliance and to support each other in the community, and I'm having the best time. All of which brings home the need for us to look deeply into nature, as Einstein suggested, and to try to understand everything just a bit better. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.